The First World War led to some rather unique ideas. With the deadlock of the Western Front setting in, each participating major power began experimenting in an attempt to break the stalemate and win the war. Many were strange, odd-looking contraptions, and some eventually beat expectations and proved successful. Aviation, for its part, had seen a huge advancement in technology, with Britain, France, and Germany leading the charge. It was with Germany that the strangest looking aircraft to fly during the war would be designed, looking far more like a toddler's drawing than a flight-capable behemoth intended to turn the tide of the war. Before hostilities, Linka Hoffman specialized in making locomotives and their associated rolling stock. The company had originally started as a manufacturer of wheels back in 1834 and quickly adapted to the mechanization of transportation with the shift to trains. With the outbreak of the First World War, a lot of industries had been moved into the realm of aviation, as that became where the majority of the nation's machine parts and engines were going to. And as the war dragged on, the need for more aircraft had become critical. This led to companies, like Linke Hoffman, to join the growing aeronautics industry and begin producing fighters for the German military. Because it lacked experience designing aircraft, it started by building aircraft under license from other, more seasoned manufacturers. These would include the Albatross C3 and the Roland C2A. While building these small biplanes gave them some experience with their construction, it didn't offer much in the way of practical knowledge in their design and engineering, especially in regards to larger aircraft. For some reason, Eadfleek figured Linke Hoffman would make a perfect candidate for the Reason Flugzeug program and awarded them a contract to build a four-engined bomber. I'm going to pause the story there and give some much-needed context. If you already know what the Reason Flugzeug program is, or maybe you don't actually care about the context and just want to hear the fate of this funny-looking aircraft, skip ahead to the timestamp on the screen. Okay, now that those people are out of the way, let's discuss what a Reason Flugzeug was. The Reason Flugzeug program was started by Eadfleek, the main administration overseeing German aviation, in 1914. Initially working with Siemens Stuckerkwerke, SSW, and Zeppelin Luftschiffbau, it created the program to facilitate the design and production of large, multi-engine bombers that allowed not only for larger payloads and crew capacity, but also the ability to repair and maintain the engines while in flight and, if necessary, in combat. This program eventually brought in many of the major aircraft manufacturers of the time and became Ferdinand von Zeppelin's pet project until he died in 1917. One such company awarded a contract was Linke Hoffman, a wholly underexperienced choice to design and make such a mammoth of an airplane. Okay, back to the story. With former AEG engineer Paul Stumpf and Dr. Eichberg at the helm of the project, construction finally began in late 1916. The first aircraft bore the designation of Laiho R1 R.8-15. With the firm's inexperience and lack of engineers, the ones they did have ended up with a lot more freedom for experimental design choices, which may have led to the eventual odd-shaped fuselage that garnered the aircraft a nickname, the Whale. I mean, who am I kidding? That's exactly why that happened. While not experienced, these engineers did their due diligence and tested their design in their wind tunnels using carefully built scale models. These tests were very promising, showing that it would perform very well in the air, having a very high lift-to-drag ratio. So construction continued, with the towering whale being completed in very early 1917. You may be curious what all that room was being used for, though, right? After all, an aircraft with such a tall fuselage is a rare sight even today. In fact, its fuselage height was only a few feet shorter than that of a modern Boeing 747. So why make it so tall? Well, the engineers at Linke Hoffman, I'm just going to refer to them as Laiho from now on most of the time to save my breath, had some rather unique plans. It was split into three separate floors, the top being for the cockpit and the radio room, the middle for the engines, and the lower floor being for the bomb aimer and fuel tanks. These bomb aimers would eventually gain the name of bombardier as the theory around aerial bombing evolved. During construction, experimental Celon was used to cover the rear fuselage in one of the many attempts to gain at least partial invisibility. 
This would end up making the experimental design even more unstable, as the material shrank and expanded due to temperature and other exterior factors, resulting in constant changes in handling during flight, which is very bad. It also proved to increase the visibility of the aircraft, as searchlights and sunlight reflected off the opaque material, something that is the exact opposite of what you want to do when you're trying to make an aircraft invisible. You want it less visible, not more. Even still, Laiho pressed on with the construction, finishing the R1 sometime in early 1917, a surprisingly short build time all factors considered. The aircraft had, as you may have guessed, very odd dimensions to it. Upon completion, it sat at 15.56 meters long, 51 feet, had a wingspan of 32 meters, 105 feet, and was 6.78 meters tall, 22 feet and 3 inches. Yes, this is about 20 feet shorter than a modern jet and about the same height as other giant aircraft of the time. But wait, you say, I thought you said it was almost as tall as the 747. Correct. However, this is due to where the height lies within the Laiho R1 and modern jets. See, a good portion of the height for, say, a 747 is in the rudder and gear combined, more than doubling the height compared to just its fuselage. So just comparing fuselage heights, the Laiho R1 sits at around 20 feet tall, just 5 feet shorter than the max height of the 747 fuselage, and almost 4 feet taller than that of the 737. Powering this flying barn door was no easy feat. It took four 260 horsepower Mercedes D4A engines to get it off the ground. They would be paired up on either side of the fuselage, being connected together into a central gearbox within the fuselage, which in turn spun one propeller on either side. On yet another side note, one successful experiment that came out of the Laiho R1 was the way in which they mounted the propellers. By utilizing an outrigger framework, the propellers were fully independent of the wings. This ended up reducing the vibrations on the wings themselves, thus increasing stability. This was for the best, as the design of the wings left them rather light. Too light, in fact, as we'll come to find out. These propellers and their engines proved enough to move the apartment with wings, and the ground trials began and then abruptly ended. See, it suffered an incident in which the experimental wheels broke. Everything about this cursed aircraft was experimental. I swear. It's as if the engineers at Linka Hoffman took what the world had learned from 13 years of aircraft evolution and tossed it into the trash. Laiho and their engineers refused to take the hints God continued to send them and designed a new set of wheels and undercarriage, which were somehow even more experimental than the ones before, and miraculously they somehow worked. It was, finally, in the spring of 1917 that it was able to take its first flight against all odds and the better judgment of man. Initially, everything was going well. Sort of. The test pilots reported its handling was much worse than what the scale model wind tunnel experiments had led them to expect. But it wasn't unmanageable, maybe even something that could be fixed. Weighing in at 5,800 kilograms, empty, or 12,789 pounds, it was rated to take off with a maximum weight of 9,000 kilograms, or 19,845 pounds. Although I highly doubt any flight at such a load would last more than 30 seconds before complete control would be lost. Incredibly, the aircraft was able to reach a maximum speed of 140 kilometers an hour, or 87 miles per hour, making it one of the fastest reason Flugzeug built and flown during the war. With these reports coming back from Laiho, Eadfleet took extreme interest in the oddly shaped aircraft, monitoring its progress and hoping to have the ability to deploy it sooner than later. Maybe if those rumored stability issues could be fixed. However, something had to give, and God was not about to let such an abomination grace the heavens. You know how I just recently mentioned the controls were at the very least manageable? Well, pilots flying the strange craft reported an ever-increasing amount of mushiness on those controls when trying to fly the aircraft eventually leading it to become almost uncontrollable on one of its flights. After a very thorough inspection, the cause of such a problem could not be determined. And so, the tests continued. That's right, a dangerous problem leading the plane to become uncontrollable was unable to be identified, so the engineers simply cleared it for further flights. I'm pretty sure I heard Boeing had extended offers to these people, not realizing they'd been dead for a few decades. On May 10th, 1917, during its sixth test flight, the completely expected happened. Two of the wings suddenly collapsed while the aircraft was flying fast and low to the ground. It immediately slammed nose first into the dirt and quickly caught fire. By some miracle, maybe divine pity, most of the crew escaped uninjured, except for two mechanics who unfortunately could not get out of the burning engine room in time. 
A further investigation came to the conclusion that the extremely light wings, the lightest of any reason Fluxoic, were to blame, and that fatigue caused them to detach from the fuselage. This would also explain the previous mushiness and uncontrollability of the aircraft on its flight before the wreck. Eadflieg, still seeing some form of potential for whatever reason, the smart move would be to remove Laiho from all aircraft production and send the people responsible to the Eastern Front, had three more ordered so that the tests could be completed for some godforsaken reason. These would bear the designation of Laiho R1, R40-16, R41-16, and R42-16. Although fitted with tons of improvements, such as redesigned landing gear and reinforced wings, the new R1 design would still fail to find success. While the modifications did lead to a much better approval by pilots on its maneuverability, this came at the cost of its speed, placing it at the seemingly standard 130 kilometers an hour, or 80.8 miles per hour. Another crucial issue, which would be the overall doom of the Laiho R1 project, was the placement of the cockpit. While it offered an incredible view when airborne, the high placement made landing almost an impossibility. Landing, as you may know, is something all planes must do. So, it being near impossible to actually get the craft on the ground without destroying the plane and killing the people was not good. The death knell of the project came in late 1917. Just after its completion, the R-1 40-16 was coming in for a landing after a rather successful test flight. However, due to the aforementioned cockpit placement, the pilot misjudged how close he was to the ground and stalled with too much altitude. The ensuing hard landing broke an axle and flipped the aircraft onto its nose. It isn't known if anyone died or was hurt in the incident, but all the records we have show that none were actually killed, albeit the aircraft would never be repaired. Eadfleek and Linka Hoffman had both learned their lesson and the R-1 was cancelled. Although the other two R-1 aircraft were completed by early 1918, they never saw service, and their fate barring any new information, is completely unknown. It's not even known if they ever even flew. They are assumed to have been scrapped before the end of the war, as even the Entente never found them. Or if they did, they deemed them so useless and embarrassing, they decided to not report them to leave the German Air Force with what little dignity it had left. Well, that ending was anticlimactic, but be not afraid. This script was based off a segment I have in my eventual full documentary about the reason Fluxoik currently in the works. I took a break from script writing to make a video for this absolute failure of an aircraft because I wanted to share the comedy with all of you fine people. If you like this video and can't wait for my eventual four hour long documentary that will be released eventually, then subscribe or leave a comment or something.